board and we are doing module four and we're doing gastrointestinal. And uh, you look at the word gastrointestinal. Let's first get into a textbook. And, uh, open it in a new window. And I could go directly to my ebook. Any different to do use cookies? Yes. Table of contents. And I'm going down to uh, where are you? Respiratory, cardio, digestive. So let's look at the word gastrointestinal, and or or your digestive system. What does that uh, What does that really mean? So bring up this. You look at the word GI, stands for gastro. Sometimes there's a slash, uh, sometimes they just put it together. So this MD, this medical doctor, is um, uh, specializes in gastro, the stomach. And remember, we have the, our connecting vowel here, which is the O. And they're also good at intestines. All right. Uh, sorry, I got to mute you so that, uh, you know, there's no feedback and stuff. Um, so GI, gastrointestinal. So this person is a, a specialist is not only the stomach, but the associated intestines. And the overall function of your stomach and your intestines is digestion. Um, now, Digest, shun, shun, process of. In order to digest, you're pretty much turning food into fuel. Okay, and the typical fuel is oxygen and uh, glucose, which is sugar. And if you see an O-S-E suffix, like this, that means you're looking at a sugar. So fructose, lactose, uh, those are all sugars, but the main sugar, which is a six carbon, that's what we're doing. And that's actually what digestion is from the second you ate your egg McMuffin this morning, uh, to when it goes out right in the form of either feces and or urine, right? Which is the, the byproducts, but what is your body actually doing, which is your stomach and your intestines. It's actually extracting whatever fuel, uh, is inside that uh, thing that you just ate. And of course, you're breathing, that's oxygen, and they're trying to extract the glucose. So this person, right, another term for this medical special, uh, specialty is gastroenterology. Uh, also, so this is GI, the same exact thing is GE. So that's gastro, oops, Entero, and that's intestines, logi. And we already know itis, so if my patient has gastritis, your GI or GE specialist will deal with that. If my patient has enteritis, inflammation or infection of uh, the intestines, that is also the same specialist. And if you have a problem with your stomach or if you're problem with your intestines, how is your ability to make glucose to make fuel? That's why when you have gastritis, or you have enteritis, uh, food isn't going down very well, and you, you get very weak and you get very tired, and it could potentially kill you. So that's the digestive system, and these specialists are really good at endoscopy, and we already know that word, endo, meaning within or insides, scopy, process of viewing. So they're really good at the process of viewing all your things are on the inside. And nowadays in the last two decades, with the advent of endoscopy, we don't have to cut you open every time there's a problem with your insides. So this is also known as your GI tract. It starts up in your mouth or your oral cavity and then uh, ends all the way in your uh, anus. And it gets separated out. Um, it gets separated, sorry, gotta be quick. Right, it gets separated out 
from the upper GI or the upper part of uh, the, um, uh, the gastrointestinal system, your upper GI. And hence you get these terms, upper GI series, lower GI series. So the cutoff is the stomach. Remember we talked about upper respiratory and lower respiratory and the cutoff was the trachea. Well, the cutoff here is the stomach. So stomach on down, lower GI, and your esophagus or your food tube on up, which is your oral cavity and your throat, and, which is your pharynx, right? And your food tube, which is your esophagus, okay? Uh, that's all uh, upper uh, GI. So if you're having an upper GI series, they're doing stuff from uh, here, the first part of the stomach, all the way uh, up here. So they're interested in all these things. But if you're having a lower GI series, we stick a tube from here, your anus, which is the opening, and the rectum is the tube that leads to the final opening. And then we go and we snake a tube all the way in here to see what's going on in here as well. So that's endoscopy, upper GI series versus lower GI series. So let's look at uh, some of uh, the stuff in the upper and uh, specifically the oral cavity. So the oral cavity, of course, the people who work on your teeth are dentists. Dent, dento, of course, means teeth. But dont also means teeth. Or odont means also teeth. But the difference between the dentist and the orthodontist is, you see this prefix here, ortho? Ortho means to straighten out things. Just like your orthopedist, your orthopedist will straighten out your feet or your bones. Well, the orthodontist will straighten out your teeth. Okay. Gengivo, of course, is the gum. So if you have gingivitis, inflammation or infection of your gums. And that's really important now clinically because there is a direct correlation with gingivitis and the, and the bacteria that deals with gingivitis and heart disease. There's a direct link. So uh, not taking care of your um, teeth and your gums leads directly to heart disease. Hypoglossal, sublingual. This is a beautiful, when you have things like this, this is a beautiful like both A and B session. So uh, these both mean tongue. So your hypoglossal nerve has to be the nerve that deals right underneath your tongue. Because hypo, remember, means under, below, or deficient. Now, sublingual also means the same thing. And uh, sublingual, lingua means tongue, right? And sublingual, a submarine goes underwater. So sub is a prefix that also means under. So uh, when you take sublingual meds, uh, like um, uh, for, for angina or chest pain, you, put, you have to put it underneath your tongue because there's, there's some veins underneath there that will, uh, that will deliver that medication a lot faster to your heart than if you swallow, um, you swallow said drug. Because if you swallow the drug, it's got to go through your GI system and your liver, and it takes too long. If you're having chest pain, or uh, also known as angina, uh, secondary to some sort of uh, lack of oxygen in your heart, which could lead to a heart attack, uh, sublingual medications uh, help very quickly. Oral, al, pertaining to, remember it is a um, adjective pertaining to your mouth. Stomato, we already learned stoma means opening, but stomato, which looks like stoma, it's the same thing, opening, mouth. So uh, stomatopathy, you have a disease of your mouth. Uh, and um, uh, we looked at uh, the diagram above between your mouth and your anus. Uh, your anus you may seem like a dirty place, but I only have to deal with one bacteria, E. coli is the only one down there that will give my patient clinical trouble. But in your mouth, there's, there's 200, 250 different types of bacteria and things in there that uh, will, uh, will wreak havoc uh, on human health. Um, that's why dentistry and taking care of your teeth and, and brushing your teeth and uh, taking care of your gums daily is very important. Saliva. Saliva doesn't just make your mouth wet when you, uh, you know, uh, when you want to swallow something or you want to eat something. 
uh, the purpose of saliva is part of digestion. There are enzymes in there and enzymes are these drugs, not drugs, enzymes are these chemicals that help break down things. Uh, so remember when your uh, parents or whoever took care of you told you to like chew, you know, chew a hundred times before you swallow that kind of thing, right? Uh, it's because we want to increase saliva. We want to break down uh, the food with our teeth because remember our total purpose of what we're all doing with this GI system is digestion. And the more I chew, the more I can break down and uh, the more saliva that I can have, the more I can break down and digest so I can extract the glucose, okay? Um, but if I have too much saliva, it's not a good thing. And tylism is too much. And uh, if I have sialuria, which is the same thing, also known as hypersalivation. So hypersalivation, Tylism and sialuria are all are, are all the same thing. Uh, anyone have a question? Uh, because I didn't put up the chat. Are we good? We're we're okay. Remember, just call out or raise, uh, right. raise your hand if uh, is there if, is there either if I'm going too fast or if you need a, a clarification. So I'm sorry, I just joined. Oh, okay, no sweat. Welcome, welcome. Right. Okay. So uh, let me mute you. So. Uh, you won't get feedback and stuff. Okay, so uh, where was it? Um, doop. All right, so all of these things are the same word, tylism, sialuria, hypersalivation. And nine times out of 10, your patient's uh, salivating too much. It's uh, endocrine slash neurologic problem. It's most likely a pituitary tumor and that's not a good thing. Esophagus, we already talked about. We already also talked about uh, scopy. So uh, esophagoscope, remember, scope is the actual instrument. Scopy is the procedure or the process. So when you call in to schedule your patient, this is how I know I'm talking to a newbie. They call in and they say, hey, I'd like to schedule an esophagoscope, right? And that's not what you're scheduling. The scope is the instrument. I know it's a minor point, but again, it's um, we're, we're in medical. There's a lo uh, there's a lot of type A personalities in medical, and uh, and there should be because we want to get things right uh, the first time. You are scheduling esophagoscopy for your patient, right? And remember, uh, when um, uh, if you have some uh, issues like going over how these things sound, if you look in your medical language laboratory. And also, let's say you don't want to even access your medical language laboratory. You can go on like Google, put type in the word. And if you notice right next to it, there's like a little like a volume symbol. You click on it and it'll tell you how to pronounce the word. And then you look in the mirror and you practice pronouncing it. Um, um, if we were in the in the class, we actually, the first couple of weeks, it sounds like an English class where we sit there, I say a word, you say it back. It's very boring and tedious, but it's, uh, it, you know, it's something that all these little skill sets, they, they accumulate and um, uh, they're things that you need in the clinical world. Pharynx, we already know that from our uh, respiratory, that's your throat. Uh, my patient could have pharyngitis or in this case, pharyngotonsillitis inflammation or infection of uh, uh, the throat and the person's tonsils. Stomach gastro, gastroscopy, that would be a lower, that would be part of a lower GI series uh, or I'm scoping uh, the stomach. Now your pylorus. Now, what's a pylorus? The best way to put it is, let's look at, oopsies. Let's look at, at this. You see your stomach here? Oh, let's get a better picture of the stomach. If I'm looking at my stomach, boop. Now inside your stomach, there's a whole ton of, of, of acid in there. And the acid is at a very low pH, meaning to say is it's highly reactive. And if it got out, there would be a problem. Now up here, and down here, if you look here, right here, see how it might be too small. Let's see, let's see a bigger picture. No, I don't wanna take your quiz. I just wanna look at the pretty picture. There you go. 
let's look at it a little better. So the stomach essentially is a big bag of muscle and it's covered in mucus. And that's the reason why all this uh, acid in there doesn't creep out and hurt you. And if you get an ulcer, which is a hole uh, in this lining, then that's when you're gonna get bleeding and it's gonna start reacting with other tissues and that's not good. Now, pylorus, here is the first part of your small intestine and that, that's called the duodenum. And we have these little sphincters or these little valves. There's one here, this is your esophageal sphincter, and there's one here called your pyloric sphincter. And there, it, it acts like a purse string and it closes up uh, in order to keep all the acid in here. And it only opens up for a small amount of time. So when the food gets churned around and processed, uh, then it gets released and then it pinches off. So if you have a, um, a sphincter problem, uh, that could open up and that's not good. And some of us have gastroesophageal reflux disease. Let's look at that word. That's a 25 cent word. But you've heard that word before. GERD. Gastro. Esophago, esophage, esophageal reflux disease or disorder. So gastro stomach, esophagus is your food tube and reflux. Re means to go back. Flux is flow. So in this pathology, what's going on here is that normally food, this food bolus, right? Should only go this way, right? Down and then boom, out into the toilet. But sometimes the food goes here. Let's say you ate a really bad street taco. So your body wants to kick up the acid to get rid of all the uh, bacteria, right? So you know when you eat something really laden with fat and salt, what happens? That acid will kick up and then it'll start hurting here, right? Around the area of the esophageal sphincter, which looks really close to your heart, doesn't it? Hence the term heartburn. There's also a misnomer for the esophageal um, sphincter. Sometimes they call it the cardiac sphincter, but nowadays they try not to call that call it that anymore because you know it's a misnomer. You're not you're not when you get heartburn, it's not really your heart is burning. It's really your food tube is burning because some of that acid is kicking back up and uh, and it's hurting you. And um, who gets GERD a lot? Uh, alcoholics because they have very very poor uh, nutrition. Also, if your diet is in high in salt, high in fat, that'll kick up a lot of the acid. And hence, if you have GERD, like me, your doctor will always tell you, hey, lay off the fatty foods, lay off the salty foods, and you can't drink alcohol, right? Mm, no fun, right? Because I think that's pretty much defined my weekend. High salt, high fat, and a beer. But nowadays, I'm, getting, I'm not getting younger. So I got to lay off the stuff a little bit. And, uh, and since I have been doing it, I've gotten less and less, right? But if you have that like constant, um, you know, like heartburn, even when you eat mild foods, or if you wake up and your mouth tastes bitter, right? Or you're always burping, something to go see your GE or GI specialist for, okay? Again, like I always say, it could be nothing, but it could be everything. So your pylorus is that sphincter. And sometimes I've got to do surgery on it, like a, um, a pylototomy, right? Pylorotomy, sorry, pylorotomy. I had to look at the uh, uh, phonetic spelling here uh, to say it properly. So that's the incision of the pylorus because sometimes, uh, you know, it doesn't open too well. So we have to uh, cut into it. And remember the difference between tomy and ectomy. Tomy, you're just cutting into something. Ectomy, that's when you're cutting things out. So we're not taking anything out in this procedure. I'm just cutting into it a little bit. Let's look at these suffixes that we all know and love. We already know alga and dynia. Uh, it's pain, so I have gastralgia or gastrodynia. I'm, it's, just, it's just a stomach ache, right? Again, uh, um, uh, if, the patient, if the patient has the chief complaint in their own words, you don't use these terms, but when you're talking to another medical professional, you use these terms. Now, vomiting is uh, emesis, emesis, potato, potato. I've heard it said three or four different ways, 
but uh, you're, um, and if you've ever seen that kidney shaped bowl, um, this thing, see this bowl? Some, uh, many times we uh, put, um, you know, instruments in it, the metal ones and stuff like that. But you could see this plastic one. And if you notice this plastic one, oh, they don't show it too well. On the sides, there'll be gradations and there'll be little numbers on the volume. And this is a 500 cc emesis basin or emesis bowl. So even if there's no gradations in it, you can kind of like use your eye like, okay, if it's halfway, my patient vomited 250 cc's. And that's really important because many times I used to do, uh, do the mistake when I was uh, a, start, a novice clinician, when I was a medical assistant, how many times I threw out the vomitus and I threw it out right away. And I should have uh, analyzed it, see what was in it. Was it partially digested food? Was it, what color was it? Was there blood in it? And the most important thing is how much volume because uh, the doctor needs to know uh, what's in that bowl. Now, those of you who've uh, had pregnancy and had what they call morning sickness, or what like many of my obstetric patients used to call morning, noon, and night sickness, because you might have had hyperemesis gravidarum. And let's break down that word, erase these words. Hyper, of course, is too much. Emesis is vom vomiting and gravidarum. Um, structure of. Gravida means pregnancy. So in pregnancy, because your hormones are all upside down, what happens? You're going to vomit all the time. And uh, well, not for everyone, but uh, for those uh, patients have hyperemesis gravidarum, uh, um, they're going to have a hard time keeping their food down. Megaly. Uh, abnormal enlargement, and uh, it didn't say here abnormal, but anything that's, that's growing too big, that's a megaly, that's an abnormal. So gastromegaly, you could also have that in gastritis, your, uh, your stomach gets, and then that's how you could see when you have gastritis or you eat a really bad street taco, sorry if I'm picking on street tacos, uh, you have like distension of your stomach and you can even feel it. There's, uh, your, your left upper quadrant of your stomach gets warm and it gets tender. Appetite, anorexia. Now, you may have heard anorexia uh, in, you know, um, maybe you saw an after school special where, uh, you know, some 13-year-old some precious girl uh, doesn't like the way she looks so she keeps on vomiting or whatever uh, or, or starving herself. Um, that is your, that is one form of anorexia called anorexia nervosa, uh, osa or osis, abnormal condition of no appetite, but a normal person can have no appetite. If you have really bad gastritis or really bad enteritis, you're not going to be in the mood to eat. So your patient will be experiencing anorexia, but if it's anorexia due to body dysmorphism, and let's look at that word. So anorexia nervosa, nerves, brain, right? Anorexia, a state or condition of no eating or no, uh, nothing by mouth, right? So anorexia nervosa, it could be from, uh, let's draw an arrow here, body dysmorphism, this abnormal morph shape ism process of so these people who are st purposely starving themselves right and they don't want to eat because they look in the mirror and they think oh i look horrible i look like a monster I, i'm so fat when they're thin as a rail this also happens if you ever go to the gym i see a lot of anorexia nervosa with a lot of the guys and a lot of guys in the gym and it's not necessarily excuse me it's not necessarily teenagers um, if you look at guys in the gym, they look at themselves in the mirror way too much versus, uh, versus women. I should know. I've been a gym rat since, I don't know, since I was 13. And, uh, also I, uh, I'll admit I'm because, uh, there, there are moments, you know, especially with the gym lights and those special mirrors that they have in the gym makes you look really good. But, um, clinically I see a lot of, uh, a lot of people living off of, uh, uh, you know, the buckets of, uh, you know, uh, those uh, whey protein and things of that matter. 
and uh, that that's a form of anorexia nervosa. Um, and I'll also admit it too. When I was younger, I was in wrestling. I was starving myself out for a meet um, just so I can make weight. And then you gain it all back. Uh, and then you have to lose it all again before the next week and it all for some silly trophy. But you know, when you're 15, 16 years old, that trophy means so much to you and self image means so much to you. You could see how it easily affects a younger person, but I also see it in also older people as well. Dyspepsia, dys, we already know that prefix abnormal, bad or painful. Uh, Pepsia is digestion, right? When something's not going down right. Okay, you ate it, you ate some food, it's lovely, but then there's some pain or some difficulty uh, in your digestion, in your uh, intestines. Dysphagia, uh, bad, painful, or abnormal swallowing. And diarrhea, let's, let's break down that word because that's kind of a, an important word. Dia, remember I changed, um, uh, modified, Die as complete or thorough. Rhea means excessive flow. So if we look at this term, excessive flow of die is complete or thorough. Now, at first, that doesn't make any sense. What, is that? what does that really mean? Now, remember, we talked about digestion. And in digestion, what am I doing? I'm eating food. And then the food turns into... Uh, uh, like, you know, products and breakdown, and I want to make fuel. But then the byproduct of the fuel will be waste. Now, what happens when you have diarrhea? And along with the fuel, there's also water. So what happens in diarrhea? Normally, I'm only supposed to have waste. But what happens in diarrhea? Everything goes. An excessive flow of everything complete so everything all the fuel and all the water that you consumed what will now it what will now it be it will be well waste so no matter what you ate when you have diarrhea it's all going right through you and that's kind of dangerous especially with a very young patient and a very old patient because dehydration right let's look at that word and you could see the beauty of uh, medical terms. One term will lead to other terms and, and you could start seeing it as a case. So dehydration, shun, process, which is the suffix. D means no or not. Hydra is, hi, uh, is water. So process of no water. And that's not very good for an infant. That's not very good for any patient above the age of 65 or even less uh, uh, if, if there's complicating sim symptoms. But dehydration is a uh, very, very is is a very, very important consideration, especially if your patient has diarrhea. And it's also the same thing when you look at their, um, you know, you look at uh, uh, in the toilet, or if you look at, you know, in the bedpan, take a take a minute or two to look at what they goes what is in that pan and uh, and the volume, because it's very it's very important to the to the clinician on what goes in my patient and what came out. And that's diarrhea. And now you know that diarrhea isn't just uh, an embarrassing, yucky thing. Uh, it's, uh, it's important and um, it's important to know what it is and understand what it is. How many, I can't tell you, I lost I think five or six infants uh, because mommy and daddy and uh, whoever they saw, uh, their, their pediatrician didn't pay attention to the level of diarrhea and they kept on just giving the baby pediasure then the baby had a seizure and then coded out and it, it all could have been prevented if you know and understand your anatomy and physiology you could see here we talked about an ulcer ulcer just means a hole and your normally your stomach is lined with mucus which will protect your stomach from the acid but when that mucus starts to wear away like i drink too much or i eat too much doritos which uh, tons of fat, tons of salt, it starts wearing away and that um, acid will start eating a hole. Um, another thing that can also increase the acidity or the acid level in your stomach is stress. So uh, uh, one of the profiles of people who get ulcers, uh, 
are people who don't eat well and they're uh, very stressed. Um, my second year in medical school, I was diagnosed with an ulcer because I'm under stress. I drink eight cups of coffee a day. I was a smoker. I was a drinker. So all of it, uh, all of it, uh, um, aligned to me getting it. And I didn't do anything about it until the blood started coming up. And that was not good. But you move on, you're a medical professional, take the meds, go see the doctor, get cleared, you go back again. And again, you could, these are all like practice for all the words. And um, it's a nice little uh, quiz. But um, again, um, my little commercial about it, after you log out, it all disappears. So you could either screenshot it and screen save it if you want. Now let's look at the lower, we're starting to look at the lower uh, GI stuff. So now we're looking at the small intestines. Now they call them the small intestines because the diameter is smaller. And um, so there's parts of this, let's look at a picture. I like looking at pictures. So if we look at this picture, I'm still, I'm still not totally used to this uh, Mac. It's annoying because I used to be a PC guy. So if you look at small intestines, you see how they're smaller in diameter. It's a smaller tube, but there's a lot of it. And then the large intestine, which is the shaded, is huge. All right. Now your small intestines, they come in three parts. And the three parts is your duodenum, right? Your jejunum, and your ileum. And they're all, and if you see duodenum, jejunum, and ileum, they all end in um, and um means structure of. So duodenum means the structure of the first part of the small intestine. Jejunin, jejunin, jejunum means the second part of the small intestine, structure of. Ileum, uh, structure of the third part of the small intestine. So we can scope these things. I can have a duodenoscopy, right? I could have a jejunoscopy. I could have an ileoscopy. There could be also disease related to all of them. Now, if I'm talking about uh, like intestines in general or the small intestines in general, that's an enteropathy. But can I have a duodenopathy, jejunopathy, ileopathy? Sure. Could I now create a hole in any of these? Yeah, but uh, typically we like doing it in the tail end, ileostomy, right? Um, and the reason why we create holes and ports to go out, because let's say I'm doing surgery on the lower GI, I don't, I want to bypass any food or anything that goes in that part so that uh, a particular part of the intestine can heal. Now let's look at the large intestine. And you'll have uh, this thing that sticks out. See this little thing? Now, this uh, like lightly shaded part, this light, light pink, that's your large intestine. And here, this is this going to be this weird thing that sticks out there. And that is uh, your appendix. Your appendix is what they term a vestigial organ. It means it's like old school. It serves no real purpose anymore. But if something gets in there, like a foreign body, most commonly like a really hard impacted bit of feces, you could get appendicitis. Now that's bad news because if that appendix bursts, all the feces is now gonna end up in your, or in your abdominal cavity and then you're gonna get sepsis, which is uh, blood poison, right? All the E. coli will now be in your blood and that's bad news, right? Easily die from that. So we're not really too worried about the appendicitis. We're worried about the sequelae um, and this word. And you know what happens in a sequel, right? It's the next thing that happens, right? So sequelae, many times in medicine, we're, we're more afraid of the sequelae than we are of the actual thing. For example, a heart attack, myocardial infarction, I am not afraid of that small little blockage. I'm afraid of what that blockage will, uh, will uh, create. And in the case of a, a heart attack, 
no one dies of a heart attack. Everyone dies of um, um, heart failure secondary to the heart attack. Um, that's what I'm afraid of. And in appendicitis, I'm afraid of the sepsis if I don't handle this correctly. And it's very, very painful, and the recovery time is very long. I had a 14-year-old female patient, uh, was misdiagnosed. Uh, by the time I got to, uh, I diagnosed it as appendicitis uh, and got it to uh, surgery. She was waiting and suffering for eight hours. Her appendix then broke, and then she spent the two weeks in, she spent two weeks in ICU because she, she went septic. And ooh, me, a whole bunch of other people got in a lot of trouble because the, we wouldn't get in trouble for the appendicitis. We got in trouble for the sequelae because we, we should have stopped it uh, before it got too far. It's amazing how you remember all your boo-boos. But honestly, it wasn't my boo-boo. But um, And also, 14 years old, I kept on arguing with pediatrics. I'm like, can someone go see her? And then we were arguing back and forth. And the next thing you know, I'm seeing her. And then, eh, all bad, bad. But it's good because you, then you learn. Colon, the whole large intestine is called the colon. So if I want to put a hole in it and connect it to the outside world, I, prefer, uh, I, I, I create a colostomy. And those of you who take care of the uh, elderly patient or work in an assisted living and things of that matter, you know that these things are tricky and they burst and open up. I never understood why we could put a man and a woman on the moon, but we can't make a bag that doesn't burst or uh, a stoma that doesn't come apart. But they're working on it. I could also scope uh, my colon using an endoscope, colonoscopy, okay? Uh, I could also scope uh, the rectum and just to, for, this is the anus, that's the opening. The rectum is the tube that here, and then you go through your sigmoid, to, uh, sigmoid, right? And then you have your ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon. And that makes sense, right? Ascending, it's going up. Transverse, trans means across, goes over, and then has to come down, so that's descending. And this is being obscured here, just like an S-shaped tube here, that's your sigmoid. Then your last tube, rectum, and then you have a sphincter down here, and that's your anus. And uh, sigmoid, sigmoidotomy, we also uh, could cut that. We could also sigmoidectomy. I could take that out if I see cancer or polyps. Uh, now, what's a rectocele? It's a herniation or protrusion of the rectum. Now, what does that mean in English? A hernia just means that there's something sticking out where it shouldn't be sticking out. Now, everything in your insides has a cover. For example, your small intestines here. If you have an intestinal hernia, right, a bit of these tubing is sticking out of the covering. And when it sticks out of the covering, it causes pain, and, it, and also it opens up the rest of the intestines for um, um, uh, infection. Now, what happens here in a rectocele, or what they call a rectal hernia? Now, uh, let's say uh, very common where you get a rectocele. Um, there's some. There's a pelvic floor here of a whole bunch of muscles holding all of these tubes in place. But what happens if you're pregnant a lot? Right, you got a lot of babies. So this gets loose, tight, loose, tight, loose, tight until the pelvic floor gets so loose that this tube bottoms out and drops out, and then it actually extends out into the out uh, into the outside world. Now that is called a recto seal, and that could also happen to the uh, vaginal tube as well. So let's look at that word. Seal means herniation. Herniation of the rectum. I could also have that if uh, my patient's female and has like a, a, a lot of children or a lot of div, div, difficult vaginal births, they could have a vaginal seal. And that's the herniation of the vaginal canal. Remember, the vagina is not the opening. The vagina is the actual muscular tube 
uh, and not the introitus or opening. Okay, and you're going to learn that in uh, uh, when we get to when we get to our um, reproductive uh, chapter. But I'm giving you a little bit now. Could my patient have both? Yeah, they can. I've seen both. And uh, um, uh, because I used to work in a community clinic where I had patients who had like eight, nine, ten children. And so what happens? So let's see. Section review again. More of uh, oh, here's a pretty picture. It's the same thing. You have your ascending, transverse, descending colon. The sigmoid is kind of wrapped up behind there, and then you have your rectum and your anus, and then you have your small intestines here. You have your stomach here. This is your liver. And this little green thing here is your gallbladder. Uh, your gallbladder, its function, oh, well, we're gonna talk about your gallbladder in a minute. But, uh, um, and then you have your spleen here, uh, which is a little bit, uh, a little bit high in this picture, a little bit lower and uh, to your stomach. Again, you could, these are lovely pictures for when you're in anatomy and physiology, nice, nice review. Oh. Here's a nice example of how we do a colostomy bag. For example, let's say my patient had a rectal carcinoma and I had to do surgery down here uh, at the level of the rectum. We cut this off, cut this off, and then we put a port that heads out to the outside world and into this colostomy bag so that when my patient eats, all the feces will go in the colostomy bag. And then, so this won't be affected and we hold that down for like six weeks or so. Or if this is totally damaged, this could be also permanent. Oh, do, 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 do. let's get to, oh, look at here. This is a pyloric stenosis. Remember we talked about the pylorus? You could, see, and stenosis we already know, abnormal condition of narrowing. And this is when, um, uh, this is quite common actually in a lot of uh, newborns. Uh, they could have stenosis here. They could also have uh, stenosis of the esophagus. And that's when the baby can't hold down milk. And he's constantly vomiting. And uh, this is sigmoidoscopy and colonoscopy. And you could see here now the sigmoid is here. It's like a little, to me in my head, it's like an S shape. And that's why I call it the sigmoid. And that's what we do. We um, we have you prep the night before, 24 hours prior, and uh, make you uh, drink this um, detergent. The detergent makes you have this massive diarrhea and it uh, washes you all out. And then uh, we put a tube and it has a fiber optic camera. We can even uh, take a biopsy of these polyps because this could be, this growth right here could be potentially cancerous. And we can even do uh, smaller surgeries if the polyp or if the mass is small. Uh, and by small, around five centimeters or so. Uh, the carcinoma cutoff point is three centimeters, so taking out something that's five centimeters is huge. Uh, vomiting, and you could see that all of this is connected to uh, a whole bunch of lymphatic systems, and all of this is connected to uh, a whole bunch of arteries. So when you get cancer, uh, um, it's bad news because it can easily travel either through your lymphatic system, which is colored here in green, or your arterial system, which is colored in red. And remember, these are conventions that textbook uses. It's not really green and it's not really red uh, when it's on inside there. And there's the different stages. Stage four always means metastasis. It means it's spreading to other organs. Let's review that word. Meta slash stasis. Stasis means the process of standing still. Meta is change. So you're changing from, and we call it METS as a, a medical slang. So if my patient has METS, that's stage four, that's end stage, that's a problem. That's a very big problem. That means the cancer has now changed from standing still to traveling, right? And there's different stages, right? But again, who, who deals with all of these stages? Who's the expert at uh, tumors? And remember, tumor just means lump or bump until we get our biopsy, right? The person who's expert at that is the oncologist.
logist, person who studies, onk, and onk means tumor. And a tumor is just a lump and a bump to you and I until uh, I have definitive proof that uh, this is cancer. Remember, he goes, uh, we're, in, we're in medical. We can't do things without proof. Uh, so I can't, like, even though your mom had cancer, your dad had cancer, it looks like you might have cancer, I cannot move until the biopsy from the uh, pathological department is complete and confirmed by the oncologist. Then we can move. Um, now, remember we talked about that bile and that gallbladder? Well, that green thing, that's your gallbladder. And the function of your gallbladder is to house this stuff called bile. Bile is, uh, is this material that's uh, created in your liver and it breaks down fats and you need it to break down fats. Problem is, because it could get diseased as well if you're eating too many fats or you're not taking care of yourself or, and also too much salt or if you have uh, advanced hypertension. All, um, a lot of this stuff can happen. So let's look, go over. Now, the gallbladder is connected to a bile duct and a bile vessel, right? Uh, it's just a, a bunch of tubings. Sometimes it's a very small vessel. So you have a cholangeal, which is a very small uh, um, uh, bile tube or bile vessel. Now, uh, bile or gall, you could have a gall stone. Now, you may be wondering, how do I get a stone inside my body? Well, if any of you do any cooking, what happens when, if you mix fat, salt, and sugar? Isn't that the, isn't that the top part of a very lovely cake? Uh, you know, the crumbly part of like, you know, a good peach cobbler? Um, when you, you mix like Crisco, which is like pure fat, uh, salt, and brown sugar, and that's also in your system as well, it makes little stones. And the stones, are also known as a calculus, okay? So a gallstone is a cololith, right? Gallbladder, if I remove it, I have to perform a cholecystectomy. And if I remove it, can you now eat fatty foods? Nope, you're done. I had a, I had a young lady two terms ago who, uh, who status post cholecystectomy. Oh, by the way, that term I just used. S slash P is status post. That is in your history of uh, past medical history. That means uh, the status of this procedure is done, right? So in her case, she had a status post, cholecystectomy. Okay, uh, 2015. So what does this mean? She had the removal ectomy of her uh, gallbladder in 2015. And how do I know? It was status post, it was done, okay? And that's what S slash P or status post means. Um, hepatitis, where am I? No, I think I skipped one. Now the bile duct, I could also cut into that bile duct, which is just a tube that leads from the gallbladder to your stomach. And that's a bile duct. Uh, that's a cholidoco. So if I remove the bile duct and the gallbladder, I have a cholidoco cholecystectomy. So it looks like a 25 cent word, but really it's just putting words that you know together and uh, attaching it with a combining vowel, which is O. Oh, that's it. Hepatitis, inflammation or infection of your liver. That's a serious thing. Pancreatitis, inflammation, infection of your pancreas, that's really bad news because um, I had a classmate of mine die of it uh, in first year medical school. Uh, he was just complaining of uh, left upper quadrant pain. He had a mild fever, didn't think anything of it. Uh, he was dead by 5 a.m. Um, because when your pancreas starts malfunctioning, it releases enzymes, it releases these chemicals that tell your body to go break down things. And one of, the, one of those chemicals reaches your heart and it tells your heart to shut off. And uh, he was only 23, 24, very, very young. But he had a history of it. Uh, his dad had died of pancreatitis and his mom had pancreatic CA uh, and, uh, and died of it as well. So uh, he kind of knew it was coming. 
cholelithiasis, iasis is just like osis. So chole, we already know, bile and gall. So they have a gall stone and it is definitely an abnormal. Um, any abnormal enlargement of my liver, hepatomegaly, um, and this term here, postprandial. Al pertaining to after I eat. So be careful with the words post and preprandial. They look very, very close, especially in pharmacology, especially when you're delivering meds, because many times there's a reason why I give the medication at a certain time because it hurts my patient. Uh, if I take postprandial, that means I need the acid to break down the drug. But if it's preprandial, because I don't need the acid. So if you take it at the wrong time, you're gonna cause a lot of dyspepsia in your patient. And if your patient uh, uh, associates pain with uh, their medication, they won't have compliance and they won't get better. Here's a lovely picture of your gallbladder and you, it leads into your um, um, uh, bile duct, which is here, and it connects here uh, into your uh, first part of your intestine, which is your, um, what is the first, duodenum. So you have your pyloric sphincter here, and then your duodenum here. And it makes sense because when all of this food comes out, we also have to break down the fat that's in there because we might not need all of it. So that's what the bile does. And right here, you could see the pancreas. This is the head of the pancreas and that's the tail, okay? And again, you have uh, this vein here and you have arteries here. They're not really blue, they're not really red. This thing isn't really green. Just like everything in your body, like shade, different shades of brown. Um, but we, we, we color these things uh, and they're, they're just utilized as conventions when we're looking at um, uh, anatomy. And I think that uh, and you could see little stones, cholelithiasis, and the cholito, uh, the cholelithiasis. You could see it's within the bile ducts and the bile vessels. Not good. That's a lot of pain and a lot of uh, dyspepsia. Um, abbreviations. We went over a lot of them. Uh, BMI, we don't usually use as much. There's other, there's other indices to know if you're too big or too small. Uh, but BMI, if you've ever done your body mass index, uh, you can be thin as a rail and still be classified as class one obese. CA, carcinoma. Uh, the other ones, GERD, I already went over. The other ones, not as popular. And, or I've already went through them, but IBD and IBS, very, very uh, common. And um, irritable bowel syndrome and inflammatory bowel disease, both are two different things, but they cause very similar dyspepsia or a really bad um, uh, um, digestion problems. Uh, a lot of diarrhea, a lot of flatulence, which is the um, proper medical term for farting. Uh, and a lot of uh, bloaty, uh, bloatiness or abdominal distension, a lot of abdominal pain uh, and cramping. And oh, it's just not fun to have. Ascites, that's uh, abnormal uh, collection of fluid within your uh, abdominal cavity. Borgmarigmus, that's all the, you know, when you got those, uh, those sounds, you know, especially when you're hungry. Um, that your stomach makes. That's called borborygmus. But we call borborygmus when it gets really out of hand. We actually put a stethoscope to your, to your abdominal wall and actually count how many times things gurgle. And 15 to 20 a minute, uh, that's when I start diagnosing uh, borborygmus. Cirrhosis is a hardening of your liver. Osis, of course, abnormal condition. It's colored yellow because here's how things work in your in your body, when it gets damaged, the first thing your body does is laden the area with fat because fat has a lot of glucose in it and glucose could, is a fuel that could be used for repair. But after a while, remember what we shared about how to make a stone, that fat will get hard. And when it gets hard, 
then um, all the processes of the liver go south and go really bad. And that's when you have cirrhosis. And again, most common, it's uh, usually um, chronic alcoholism. Uh, celiac, diverticular disease, yeah, yeah, you look that up in, uh, um, when you're in your pathology class. For us, for our purposes, not as important. Dysentery, not as, uh, not as common uh, uh, here in the United States, but um, it's when uh, bacteria gets out of hand and it's marked with uh, severe diarrhea and dehydration. Um, GERD, we were on hematochesia, passage of stool that is bright red blood, okay? Hemat means blood. Now, if you pass stool or feces that's, uh, that's colored black or it's sticky like tar, that's called melena. Now, if you have melena, odds are it's an upper GI bleed. That means it's above the level or at the level of the stomach. But if you have hematochesia, it, uh, since it's bright red blood, arterial blood, it's probably at the level of the colon. Hemorrhoid, it's, um, we have a whole bunch of veins in our uh, rectum and near our anus. And when they get twisted and um, uh, uh, they get twisted and they get they get engorged with blood, it starts becoming very, very painful, also known as piles and hemorrhoids. Hernia, we already talked about, IBD, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease. Uh, you look at ulcer, of course, makes holes. Colon, inflammation or infection of my colon to the point where it's making holes in my colon. And that's not good for digestion whatsoever. And like I said, IBD, IBS has a lot of really, really nasty symptoms. And it's chronic meaning to say it ick pertaining to time. It is progressive and it'll be for the rest of your life. Pancreatitis, peritonitis. Now peritonitis, your peritoneum is the covering of your abdomen. And again, you get appendicitis uh, and then sepsis, all of this will get infected and then you have peritonitis and that's bad news. Volvulus sometimes, you know, it looks like the word revolving. It sometimes uh, uh, your intestine starts twisting around and that causes pain. Usually because there's some heavy obstruction and then, you know, it twists around like, uh, you know, like a string on a, with, with a weight. Kind of like in the same way, you know, when you play, you, you know, you mess around with a yo-yo and the yo-yo gets all, uh, the string gets all tangled. Same thing happens with your um, intestines. Now we could do a barium enema or barium swallow. That means the patient uh, gets to uh, drink this stuff and it looks like Gatorade, but tastes like heck to me. Um, it has a radio opaque contrast medium. That means when I do a, uh, um, an abdo abdo abdominal plate or abdominal x-ray, you start glowing in the dark. What do I mean by that? Let's look at uh, what a barium enema looks. So we make the patient drink this stuff. And then when they drink it, you see here, you see how this is where the, uh, the, the barium isn't. But when I do a, a, an abdominal plate or abdominal x-ray, you can see how all this lights up. And heck, look at here. We found stenosis. We found stricture. And that's probably what's causing my patient's dyspepsia. You see all through here, the ascending. Transverse is good, but then right at the flexure, oh, it's getting small, and then it gets really bad here. So that person is not going to digest very well. CT, computerized tomography, we already went through. Oh, they already showed uh, uh, barium enema. Hmm. Endoscopy, remember we went through upper, lower GI, MRI. Now, stool guaiac. That's just a fancy term for, um, it's called a, um, uh, an occult stool test, also known as hemocult. So stool guaiac, hemocult, and something that's occult is hidden, right? Uh, hemo means blood, so it's hidden blood. Because many times you look at feces, it looks just look, 
looks just like a big brown mess, but there could be blood in there hidden. So we do stool guaiac, also known as a hemocult test, and then uh, that will uh, see if uh, there's blood in there. Ultrasound, we already went over that before. Appendectomy, oh, what's a laparotomy or a laparoscope? Let's look at that. Laparotomy. Now, we look at that. Tomy means to cut. Lapar, ab abdomen. To cut into the abdomen. Now, when I perform a laparotomy, I just want to see what's inside. Many times, if it's filled with blood or other, other fluid like ascites, remember, like too much abdominal peritoneal fluid, I have to open you up and have to see what's going on. I irrigate everything. Well, not me, but the surgery guy, right, or gal, right? They look in it. So they're cut into the abdomen. They're not taking anything out. They're just looking to see. Now, nowadays, if we can perform a, lapa, a laparoscopy. So process of scoping or viewing the abdomen, okay? But many times, especially if there's a massive internal bleed or what they call um, surgical abdomen, uh, I can't scope. Um, we have to go straight to the operating room. The neat thing about scoping is I only have to make these little tiny holes and it won't, you'll have a, uh, uh, um, a much better healing process. Uh, bariatric surgery is for uh, people who are morbidly obese, not normal obese. We're talking about, if you ever watch that show, 600 pound life. I do not condone these as a professional because there's, uh, there's a lot of complications. And out of the four people that I uh, approved of this, three out of four of them died eventually. Uh, due to complications, because if you start messing with your anatomy, there's a whole bunch of uh, stuff that goes on. Now, remember we talked about stones? This is a way that I crush them or get rid of them, and I perform lithotripsy. And I could perform an ESWL, which is an extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy. Say that 25 times fast. But if we look at it, it's not really hard. Extra means out of, corpo means body. So External to my body, I'm going to have this shockwave machine that's going to send waves, uh, sound waves, into my body. And what will it do to the stones? It'll crush the stones so I can pass them. NG, or nasogastric intubation, I'm going to put a tube. And that's if I have to get at your stomach. Let's say, uh, last time I did an NG tube, um, I had a 16-year-old female. She, she ate like... 300 Tylenol pills or something like that. She tried to commit suicide. Uh, so we had to st uh, pump out her stomach. And the way we do it is we put an NG, tu NG tube in it, in her, through her nose, goes down her esophagus, down into uh, her stomach, and then we remove all the stomach contents. And it was something like 200, 200 pills or something like that. Ant acid. Ant means against, against acid. Anti-diarrhea, against diarrhea. Anti-emetic, against, uh, anti means against, against vomiting. Uh, most common, odansetron. H2 blockers, uh, they, um, the, the nerve that releases acid uh, has something called an H2 receptor or a histamine receptor. If I block it, then it won't release acid. And of course, laxative, uh, um, makes your or stool softener. Um, these are common uh, pharmacological stuff that goes on. And last but not least, here's your cases and that's your discussion uh, um, discussion for the week. Look over this case and you tell me which part is the subjective part, which part is the objective part, which part is the uh, assessment or diagnosis, and which part is the plan? Now, this, of course, is easy. It, it tells you. But look at the medical term that's in each one and then um, uh, um, define it. So, for example, don't say, oh, the plan is, and then copy and paste it. The plan is what? Now, go through each part 
and say and, and explain it as if you're trying to explain it to somebody who doesn't know any, um, any medical terms. So I'm going to help you with uh, the plan part. So for the plan, patient has been advised to schedule a colonoscopy and go to the emergency department. So what are we going to tell our patient? What's this colonoscopy? So when I do my SOAP, I'm going to go S O A P. And then when I submit my P, what will it be? The plan is to perform uh, a, a scope viewing of the colon. You can write lower GI, you can write um, a large intestine. You see how uh, that's how you will answer your discussion. So you're kind of uh, do, doing like a translation of what your subjective, which is your history, uh, objective, if there was any, was there any laboratories or any physical examination performed, assessment, which is the diagnosis, and, and also uh, assessment and impression, they're together, the diagnosis, and then I already gave you the answer for the plan. And that's all that we need to do for uh, the discussion for this week. And going forward, we're gonna be, uh, doing more of these cases um, because that's essentially uh, um, a better way of, um, of looking at medical terminology, looking at terminology within the context of how you actually uh, read it. All right, with that said, that is the conclusion of all the items in the digestive. Make sure you do your medical language lab. And if uh, I award you a grade, uh, that is not commensurate to what you see, especially if it's a zero and you did work, please uh, uh, report it to me so uh, and screenshot it. And if you don't know how to screenshot, it's, con it's uh, uh, what is it, control print screen for Macs. And I'm uh, not for Macs, for PCs. And for Macs, it's shift command four, right? For example, on Mac, since I'm on a Mac right now, I want to take a picture of this, of everybody who is on here. So I can do shift command four, and then this little arrow comes out, take this, and it took a picture of it. Okay, so I know, uh, um, uh, but I, we were a small class, and most of you guys are here anyway. So does anyone have any uh, questions of what to do? Remember your quiz, your medical language lab, and uh, this week's discussion. And if you look at this week's discussion, it's to describe the S, O, A, and P, of uh, either this case, which is, I believe is pretty straightforward, and or here's another case as well that you could also do. Just pick one. Don't have to do both, just pick one. All right, does anyone have any questions, comments? Yes, I do. This right. is uh, Ms. Bayes. I am uh, wondering, uh, so for the discussion, the mm -hmm. S-O-A-P, Format? Would you like it in in that context, or no? Like, uh, like you make a Microsoft Word, and then of course, no, no. no. What I'm saying is like how you just did the S O A P, yes. right? Do uh -huh. you want us to do it like that, or would you like us to write it the same way we've been doing our discussions? Uh, either way, you if you put it like in a narrative, yeah, like this is the subjective. This is you know, like in full sentences. Yeah, either way. Uh, oh, either okay, way. Or, or we can use this format. Yeah, or just use this for either way. And remember, we got the, you got this out of your textbook, right? Uh, uh -huh. uh, the case. So what would your citation be? It would be the textbook. Right. Right. So then you put your APA uh, format citation. And those of you who are your, your citations are either missing or off, I put a, a little video and uh, please, if the video isn't enough, please give me a call so we can uh, share the screen and I could show you, uh, um, you know, one-on-one uh, -on, -one on how to, uh, how to navigate that. Because uh, um, your future professors, they're just, they're just gonna start chopping off points and or, or they're gonna start calling it plagiarism and that's when it gets ugly. When they start, they're like, but they're like, I, you were like, I didn't cheat. And they're like, well, you didn't put it in proper format. That's cheating, that's plagiarism. And then they're going to 
some some of your English professors they're real sticklers uh, because uh, in the past they've been you know they've been duped by other students but not us but uh, but again I, I everything I do I do for a reason and also for future reference when you're when you're in a meeting and everyone has their opinion but no one has any data no one's gonna listen to you right uh, but if you have data if you have something from uh, some some legitimate source dot gov dot edu and most recent no one can no one can refute you and then it's amazing you then become the smartest person in the room when actually you just did what you just provided evidence so that the rest of the team can now be on your side because you you guys know you guys work in the real world you put five you put five medical professionals in a room you're going to get six opinions Opinions are nice. They're good. Okay, fine. We all have degrees, but the problem is who has the best data and that, and, 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 and that's why we're having so much confusion in this world, politically and socially, because no one looks at data. Everyone thinks what, right? That, uh, Oh, it's killing everybody. Is it really? Uh, it goes, it, it's killing because it it's killing a, a certain profile of people and medical professionals need to, Need to know and understand that because it's making everyone scared and you guys see what fear can do you've seen all over the country and all over the world uh, especially in the last couple of weeks especially in the last couple of months what fear can fear and lack of data can do uh, and and did you guys notice no, nothing on any cdc or department of health people like an actual department of health person talking in the last couple of months they don't want to hear from us they don't want to know things they just they just they just uh, they just want to, uh, people just want to support their narrative. But we in the medical field, we don't do that. So, and every case is really important and every life is uh, important. Therefore, it should be marked with data. Like this, the subjective, that'll be what? Anything in the history, okay? But I can't make a diagnosis without, I have to have, uh, I have to have vitals. I have to have a physical examination and I have to have labs to support my history, to support my diagnosis. So you could easily see how in this world of rushing through this to make money, why many people go to a doctor and they don't get help. It happens every day. Like, oh, I've been this doctor for six months and I'm still not, then find another one. Find one that does all this, that takes the time, that actually knows your history. Um, but uh, a lot of people don't, right? And if your doctor doesn't, who should know it? Your nurse, the the people who support the uh, who support the physician and other members of the team, um, because right now this this will follow you the rest of your life. Anyone have any other questions regarding uh, how the uh, how to answer and uh, this week's discussion? And if you do your discussion early, uh, like today or tomorrow, I can answer it. And if it's if it's a little off or there's some part that I don't understand or that you don't understand, uh, you still have the rest of the week to, you know, to, uh, to fix or adjust or, or whatever needs, whatever need be. Alrighty. Does everyone, anyone else have any other questions on how the discussion is going to go down and what else is due today? If no. not, have a good day, everyone. And um, no. I'll see you guys next week or during the week. Alrighty. Okay. okay, thanks. Have a good, have a good week. Have fun.